Hey, friends and family. Welcome to the Don't Stifle Me podcast. My name is Jacob Stiefel, and I'm glad you're back, or I'm glad you're here. If this is your first time listening, awesome. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you enjoy your time, our time here together. If you do enjoy the talk, please make sure you click subscribe on whatever you're listening to, whether it's iTunes podcast app or Stitcher or YouTube. Click subscribe, and then all the new episodes will just be automatically download, downloaded to your device. Also, make sure, you know, scroll back and look through the past conversations that I've had. There's some really, really good ones, good talks in the past. So check those out. Now, at some point here on the Don't Stifle Me podcast, we will, when the right partnership comes along, I'll get some advertising and there'll be a, maybe a one or two commercials at the beginning and end of the conversations. But oh, that's only going to be when it's something that I believe in, that I think we'll all benefit from, that you'll benefit from hearing, etc. Until then, though... This podcast is solely listener funded, so it's all based on your what you know what you think we're worth over here. And so there's no advertisements or commercials as of now. This is what that is. And this is me inviting you over to patreon.com slash DSM podcast. There you can get exclusive access to behind the scenes pictures, video, audio downloads, and things from these conversations in the days that I go talk to people. I take pictures and stuff throughout the conversation. And there's more perks and packages and things you can check out. And that's for donations, monthly donations, as little as a dollar a month, you know, a dollar, three dollars a month, five dollars a month, like the cup of the cost of a cup of coffee. And you get some behind the scenes stuff. But go check that out. Patreon.com slash DSM podcast. And now we'll get on to today's episode number twenty seven. All right, today's episode. Earlier today, I got to ride up to Hendersonville, Tennessee, just north of where I live here, close to Nashville, and we got to go to the lakefront home of Tim the Fiddleman Watson. Tim, Tim is the, he's originally from close to where I'm from down near Fort Payne, Alabama, but he's been up in Nashville since the mid eighties playing fiddle, singing, entertaining people every chance he's gotten. And it's been a whole lot of chances. I'm telling you, he's played with so many people. I mean, you, you'll just, you'll hear when you listen to the story, but I mean, Tammy Wynette, Waylon Jennings, Keith Whitley, Willie Nelson, now like recently Kid Rock, he's gotten to be really good friends with. And we talk about all that and he's got great stories and I'm not going to talk much more about him. He's an awesome guy. Above all that, he's an awesome dude. And I had a great time sitting down and talking with him. So here it is, my talk with Tim Watson. Start talking, and we'll just work it in there. Fiddle uh, man, yeah, man, yeah, dude. <laughs> I've been uh, looking forward to, to meeting you and talking to you. Not even even since before I even did this podcast thing. Well, cool. I've been trying to. I tried to make it to several of your shows, and it just never worked out. Something yeah. was going on. I was playing somewhere, or something <laughs> like that. Um, That's a good problem to have. It is. It is a good problem to have. <laughs> You've, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it in a minute. But I actually emailed. I emailed Tim here before. I emailed you before I even moved to town. I don't know if you remember or not. Yeah. But I told you, like, hey, I'm you just moved to town or moving to town. I know these people that you know, some you know, some of the Joneses and Collinsville folks and yeah. Ronnie Ross and Randy Graves and all these people oh, that yeah. we had in common. Um like Ronnie's Ronnie's son, David Ross, was like my best friend when we were in sixth, seventh oh. grade. And Randy and Sarah Graves, before Randy passed, they yeah. lived like a mile and a half from mom and dad. Is that so right? Really good friends. So everybody I told was like, "Oh, you got to get with Tim Watson when you get to Nashville. Yeah, you got to talk to him." So I uh, so I emailed you that day, and I actually have the email oh, cool. here, and we'll uh, let let you look at this in a minute. How long but, uh, ago was this? This was June second of two thousand nine. Oh wow! I emailed you, yeah, and I just kind of said, "Hey, I'm moving to town, looking for a job in music." Or yeah. maybe engineering or whatever, because I have a civil engineering degree from Alabama. Oh, wow. I didn't know. I knew I wanted to be in music, but I didn't know yeah. at that point what I wanted to do. I wanted to play guitar and yeah. be involved. Uh, but you had, was, you took the time and sent me like a long, long email back. 
and some of the best advice that still I read it. This, I went back and read it this morning and just the truest, most honest advice <laughs> that I could have gotten. Well, uh, I wouldn't but, steer you wrong, especially if you're friends of uh, some of my friends, you well, know, yeah. I, so many people, you know, Nashville can be such a, a town full of uh, crap, you know, people will tell you what you want to hear. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to sugarcoat it for anybody that's planning on, especially if they're going to invest their young life into trying to be something in this town. You better know what you're getting into. You right. Know, it's not, uh, it, it ain't what a lot of people think it is on TV. And it's so interesting, like going back and reading it now, eight years later, it was just, <laughs> just all true. It was just all exactly. Oh, it wasn't great, good or man. bad or ugly. It was just kind of like, Hey, this is, this is how it is. In there, it says like, you know, you're going to, be prepared to hear people say, no, we're not interested. Or, you know, if you, if you have somebody say, yeah, give us some money and we'll, we'll do this for you. Then to <laughs> run away from those people, you yeah. know, like, uh, just all good things. But uh, uh, that's good. <laughs> so how does, uh, see so from the, you're from the big town of, are you from Collinsville or is that uh, technically not actually okay. I'm, I, where I'm from is a little community called black Creek and it's on uh, what people down there nowadays call lookout mountain parkway. So okay. it's, it's up on the mountain it runs from Gadsden up to Fort Payne and uh, I'm right in the edge of Edward County is where black Creek is. It's not on the map, but yeah, about 12 miles from, I Nocalula looked up, Falls. I Googled it I'm like, black <laughs> Creek. I lived there for my whole life. And, and you know, I lived there for 18 years. And I was like, I've never even heard of black. Yeah. Creek, there's so. a little fire department. My granddaddy had a little country store there when I was growing up. And, and, uh, so a lot of people knew the older folks know where black Creek is. Cause they always had ball games there. And, oh, okay. Uh, and my granddaddy's old <clears throat> store was there, but now there's a little volunteer fire department. And that's about it. Yeah. So uh, nothing there. <laughs> so is that, uh, how old were you when you started playing music? Oh man, I, I was the youngest in the family, so I really, uh, my oldest brother was a choir director, and uh, and my second brother played organ, and my sister played piano, and so they all all yeah. played music, and my and uh, was it a family thing like before yeah. that, parents and grandparents? Yeah, or? my and my granddaddy was a fiddle player. He's the one that uh, he never played professionally or anything like that, but he was a Big old fat man wore his overalls every day, and yeah. he ran a little country store there on the mountain, and uh, and he also had a little barber shop built on the side of it. And uh, all the folks around would I knew everybody, yeah, you know, because you was at the store, and I was pumping gas and stuff. Time I was old enough to walk, you know, oh yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> but he he had a lot of friends that played music on the mountain, you know. And, and I'm talking about some of these people back up on some of them dirt roads, you know, they yeah. didn't come out in daylight a whole lot, you know, <laughs> and, and, uh, they'd bring banjos and fiddles and, uh, saxophones and all their guitars and just whatever. Bases, Let's just round up all the yeah. musical instruments we can get. We'll it was go. pretty incredible. I and mean, we had some old church pews out in front of the, on the porch of the old store and out by the gas pumps. And yeah, people would come from everywhere and sit out in front and they'd just, people would show up with their instruments and play music and, and I barely could remember that because I was really small when they did that. And they kind of mm. quit doing it. My granddaddy, he kind of quit playing music when he got older. He's got arthritis and stuff in his hands. And, and uh, one day I just I thought, man, I think I remember granddaddy playing fiddle. So I, yeah. I went and asked him about it. And he was like, oh, yeah. And he goes back to his bedroom, reaches up under the bed, and pulls this old dusty fiddle case out from under the bed and, and uh, dusts it off, gets the old fiddle out. And. And he starts trying to play a little bit on it. You know, he never was really a great player, but he yeah. he had a few few songs that he knew. And my grandmother right. played guitar, okay. And she had an old old arch top guitar, and she got it out. And they sat around and played a few little tunes. And I had an old uh, reel to reel tape recorder. Oh yeah. And uh, so I recorded them playing, and then I he showed me just some simple little tunes, and <clears throat> and I would practice them and, you know, yeah. and I'd, I'd get mad and quit, you know, and, oh, and he yeah. taught me a lot of stuff wrong. He, he it's so funny, man. He, he originally taught me that there was no sharps or flats on the fiddle. <laughs> <laughs> and it's cause his hands were so big. He had these big fat fingers and the, his uh, just went to where his yeah. fingers touched together on the, and covered the whole neck. Wow. And so it was like, I guess there ain't if you, yeah, he didn't have way. much of an option. Yeah. So, you know, it was, it, that got me kind of started and, and I, just kept meeting more and more players down there as the years right. went on. And 
Next thing you know, when I was like 13, I was playing playing these uh, chicken wire honky tonks down there. Oh, yeah? <laughs> wow, 13. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. It was nuts, man. Did they ever, did did y'all ever start getting back together like they did back in the day, or was it, by yeah. that time was it? Yeah, man. I, I when I, it, it was kind of, I started playing around down there, and I, I there wasn't a lot of fiddle players, you know, in that time down there. And, yeah. And uh, one of one of the fiddle players that I did meet when I was still in high school, the only professional musician that I knew was a guy that lived in Fort Payne up there on the mountain, uh, Paul Justice. Everybody called him Mouse. Okay. And he played for Mel Tillis. And uh, ah. And so I would I got introduced to him and I'd go up and see him and he was uh he he drank pretty bad you know so it's like he would uh he'd show me things though he'd show me little things and correct things that I had, wasn't doing right yeah and uh, and he would uh, he played for Mel Tillis but he he every time he'd get fired from Mel Tillis he'd go to work for Johnny Paycheck <laughs> and then Johnny Paycheck had fired me go back to Mel Tillis wow. and this happened for. That's a hell of a, that's a hell of a duo to me. Oh yeah, yeah man! And so uh, I'll never forget though. I was like probably fifteen. I went out to his house one day and, and up on the mountain in Fort Payne, and I go up to the door and the door's just barely cracked open, you know. So I knock on the door and yell in there, "Come on in!" You know. And so I walk in and and I'll never forget Mouse and Johnny Paycheck are sitting in the kitchen floor <laughs> <laughs> drinking vanilla extract because <laughs> they'd run out of everything else. It was a dry county back then. Oh, yeah. And uh, it was so funny. They are like, come here, get you a drink of this cake. <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> wow. But he would teach me things, you know, because I used to play with a real stiff bow arm, mm -hmm. and he would uh, he'd get about right, and he'd slap my arm. You'll never mount to shit playing like that, you know. And, <laughs> yeah. and he'd like, you got to get that arm loosened up. And make that wrist move. Make that elbow move. Make that shoulder move. It's got to all be fluid. It's got to yeah. move, you know. And, and I credit him totally for the bow arm that I've got. Yeah. Because, man, that's one Loosen thing that I've, up, yeah. I've got to bow arm, you right. know. And, and uh, it's I so hard. That I've got a, a cheap little fiddle. And yeah. it's just, I know I can play like Oh Susanna, and on a good day, I can get through Dixie. That's about it. That's <laughs> yeah. my repertoire. Right. But yeah. it's so much in the bow. I, I like a just lot. getting it Especially to not fiddling. sound like shit. Yeah. <laughs> fiddling is yeah. all about the bow. Yeah. You know? it, but anyway, I met him, and he introduced me to more people, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I was playing with a little band down there. It's like one of the only country bands that kind of played around the area. Yeah. And I got introduced to them when I was probably like, I was probably 12, 13. And uh, they had a weekly TV show that on, uh, in Anniston. Oh, yeah. And the, so, big, the big city. Yeah, the man, man yeah. Channel 40 in Anniston. So uh, UHF, we was on the high bands. <laughs> <laughs> and so, man, I... Uh, they they hired me to play fiddle for them, and I was awful, man. I mean, I really at that time I was just barely learning how to. I, I learned what a feel was, you yeah, know, and I was learning right. how to, you know, how to play around the singer and stay out of to the play vocal with way. people, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, bluegrass, you know, they would just you played, you know, a solo, and that was basically it. You and know, then stayed out of the way. Yeah. So it yeah. Turned, turned around. This they they taught me kind of what to do and when to do it and. Let me feature, and they were playing clubs and stuff down there. So we'd go yeah. and play, you know, down at the Wrangler. And we we opened the Wrangler in Talladega back oh. then, and and uh, a bunch of cool clubs played all over the place. But uh, they came to Nashville to record, and they were always coming up here and recording. So I came with them and uh, started meeting people up here. And, and of course, back then Nashville was like a different 15 town. Or something oh yeah, like that. I was I, wow. I was actually uh, probably about probably thirteen or fourteen when wow. I first started coming up here and playing on a few little records, and and then as I got older, I kept meeting more and more people up here, you know, and, and more and more bands, and you just kind of find your niche and where you right. can kind of fit in, and and uh, but man, I, I tell you, it's been it's been a lot of fun through the years getting to do all you know because the people you look back at it after you get as old as I am, you look back and you think, geez, man, it's all the people that you've known, yeah, and along, worked with along the way. And oh, yeah, it's incredible when you look back at it because uh, I mean, when I <clears throat> I'll, I'll never forget the kind of the I, I had a friend Ronnie Osborne in Fort Payne. He's oh, a yeah. judge in I Fort know, Payne yeah, now. Ronnie, yeah. Well, Ronnie is a. a a long time friend of mine. We go way back mm -hmm. to he. He actually, when he's in high school, he dated my sister. Oh, okay. And so I knew him from back then. And they always had little bands and stuff playing around. And and uh, so Ronnie got on to me. He was like, "Man, Opryland's coming to Birmingham. They're gonna have auditions at UAB." 
and we need to go. And I was like, man, I ain't going. Nobody <laughs> cares nothing about it, you know. And I was playing a little club down in Alabama. Yeah. And uh, and I was going down the wrong road at that time. You know, I was I was pretty young and still in school, still in high school, taking part in things. Yeah, just just uh, really doing stupid crap that you do in the you know in the early eighties. Oh, yeah. And so I I was just totally not into going. And, and he called me up that morning, and I was kind of hung over a little bit. I played the, the big bar the night before, and I was right. I was the guy in Alabama. You know? Oh yeah, I, I was the guy for fiddle. But when I came to Nashville, I got my lunch ate. You know, right. so uh, old, I, old big fish, small <laughs> pond, small oh, fish, definitely, big pond thing. Oh, definitely, definitely. And I, I'll never forget though, Osborne wouldn't take no for an answer. Yeah. And so he, I told, I hung, I hung up, and I was going back to sleep. Man, now he. He drives out to my house on the mountain out wow, there. Wow, and got you. He's beating on the window. He's like, get your ass up. You're going to Birmingham. You yeah. know. So anyway, so I, I roll out, and I said, well, I'll go with you if you're going to audition, and yeah. I'll watch you. You know. And so we get down there, and I go in and look, and there's a lot of people, dancers and all this stuff, you know, just yeah. just. No, no fiddle players, though. That's for, like, the amusement park, the Opryland. Yeah, thing. Opryland yeah. Park back then. And uh so I, anyway, everybody was auditioning. They were cutting people off, you know, as soon as they'd start. And, yeah. And so they had this whole sheet you needed to fill out in order to audition. You know, it's like, what songs are you going to play? Do you have sheet music? Do you have accompaniment tape? Yeah. Do you have all this crap? You know, yeah. and I just wasn't into it at all. So I just wrote across outside the lines in big letters, what do you want to hear? Yeah. <laughs> and so I just went wow. in because I didn't figure they were going to care anything yeah. about me because I don't read music and nothing like that, you know. And so I'll go into the audition and I see all the the people at the table they have like a that was the original star search or, or whatever yeah. you call it now but they had the, a big panel of judges sitting in front of you on the stage and there's a whole auditorium full of people waiting to audition sitting out there watching and so i walk out and there's i see them chuckling because of what i wrote on there you know yeah. and so the guy says uh which turned out to be John Haywood, which is a he was our entertainment director for years out there. But he was a great guy. He's married to Louise Mandrell. Oh, okay. And uh, <clears throat> but anyway, he said uh, he said so. He said uh, play us a play us a waltz. So I lit into Tennessee waltz, played yeah. that, and, and I sang it. And when I sang, there was no accompaniment, no no just, nothing, just vocal. Yeah. And it's got a I don't know you're probably familiar with the song. It's real low, and then it goes way high, and it's like a big range song. Yeah. I got finished in there this. This one guy on the panel that's kind of, he's all about orchestral stuff and reading. And so he was like, what key are you in? And I told him I was in D. So he goes over and hits a D on the piano. And just out of pure luck, I happened to be singing right on pitch. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway, then he was like, play us a hoe down. And then I was like, wow, they've been cutting everybody off after one little piece of a song. So, so I, I got to do two, two songs, two, yeah. full songs too, you know, and then uh, – then they said, "All right, just play anything you want to play." So I played some—I forget now, but it was some fancy, one of those fancy fiddle songs that yeah. I always did, you know. And, and uh, the crowd favorites, and, yeah. And, and, and so I got a standing yeah. ovation from the people waiting. <laughs> and so, from the people waiting, yeah. And I got a real—I still got it somewhere. It's big write up in the Birmingham News and all ah, that, you know. So nice. Uh, so uh, like a week later, I get a call from them, and mm -hmm. they're like, "How soon can you be up here?" And I was like, "Give me three hours." Yeah. <laughs> and so I Let me grab threw a shit. bunch of crap in the bag, yeah. and I came up. And uh, anyway, I I worked for them for almost thirty years doing shows, thirty one years. Wow. You know? And uh, when the park closed, I went to the General Jackson, you know. But I had the yeah. number one show out there for shoot fifteen at the years park or better. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's been that's been gone for a long time now, but yeah. that was kinda got me established here in Nashville, you know. I had a steady gig instead so of So that's what working. got you moved up here was the, Yeah. 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 And I came wow. up I, Thanks Ronnie Osborne. I yeah. know it, man. Yeah. I tell you and I, it's funny, I was just telling you I've I've been down this uh last few days been down cleaning out my mom's house. She passed away last week and so We've been down there trying to get stuff cleaned out, and I found a, a brochure from that that had Ronnie Osborne's mailing address on it. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's I was cool. like, I got Frame to send this to Osborne. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, it's, that's the hardest thing is getting established in this town. And I had been coming up, and, and I'd met some big time people and everything, but getting established where you can actually live here. Yeah. And, so many people move here, and yeah. then they're like, okay, how do I get in? And a lot of times the getting in part, 
it's not the hardest, but it's it's pretty tough. Like you know, because yeah. you got a lot of people have to get a day job to be yeah. able to pay rent and stuff while they're going out and meeting people. But like, luckily, you had done some of the meeting yeah. throughout the years, and then that just got you right up here. Yeah, my mom was always afraid, you know, because my dad died when I was twelve, so she was always afraid I was oh, wow. going to quit school and, and yeah. come up here into Nashville. So she made me promise her I wouldn't quit school. So graduate high school. Yeah. yeah. So I, it was funny because a lot of the kids that that I was going to school with thought I was full of crap when I tell them stuff I'd been doing all weekend. Oh, wow. Because I was touring. I was in the, huh. until, until one Friday afternoon, as soon as school was out, there was a tour bus sitting out in front of Collinsville High School to pick wow. me up. <laughs> and so I had my clothes in the, in the out there, you know, and ready yeah. to leave. And so I'd catch, <clears throat> catch a tour bus on Friday and, and be going all weekend, you know, and coming to Nashville or wherever, you know, and then leaving from high school and uh, yeah for y'all out there listening collinsville high school like how many people did you graduate with from, from uh, collinsville? 27 27 people yeah and you're <laughs> yeah. graduating class yeah i think that's right if it's i not, remember it's not a huge school no it's that. first through 12th was in the same building back then so. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> but we uh i had been like, before i got the job at opera and i'd been been working with a lot of different people we had a little, i came up here with a little band <clears throat> that uh, some of the guys were from fort Payne and and center and mm-hmm. different area. We had a little group called Dixie Gray back then, and okay. uh, we had a record deal. Billy Sherrill and uh, anyway, it just it didn't quite pan out. Some of the guys were we were all young, but I was always yeah. the youngest usually. And so they these guys were newly married and didn't want to be gone from home. Yeah. And, and when it this this thing that we'd been working on finally started to happen, it scared them. And uh, <clears throat> I'll never forget uh, my old friend Terry McMillan was a, he's a famous harmonica player played on if you heard Garth Brooks ain't going down to the sun coming oh, yeah. up and that, stuff oh, like him? that yeah. that's Terry he played awesome. on everybody's <laughs> records back then George Jones and Dolly Parton everybody yeah but uh, he's he passed away about ten eleven years ago but but uh, he was me and him I, I used to live with him when I first moved up or started coming up here staying a few days yeah. he let me hang out in his guest room or somewhere on the nice. couch or something you know and. And so he ended up producing Dixie Gray and uh, got us a deal and everything. And so we were really starting to pop. We were we were going everywhere. Was that when you moved up here? Or like it was right before, before I moved okay. up here. I really, gotcha. I was. But we were we were already had a deal and we're touring. Huh. You know, so uh, I didn't really have a steady place. But I didn't really move here permanently until the day after I graduated high school. And so yeah. I, I, all right, I, mom, I did it. I, I did, I'm out. and I had a bag packed, and I've been here ever since. But yeah. But, you know, it's just uh, I was still able to work out of here, and I could meet a – if a tour was going south, I'd just go over the interstate and meet them or something, you know, and and or come to Nashville and catch a bus or whatever, right. you know, back then. But it's it's been a <laughs> – I, I was kind of funny the other day. I was thinking about it. You know, some guys were like, "Oh wow, man!" You know, seeing some of my old pictures. You know, with some of the people, so the old stars that I worked with. You yeah. know, and they're all like, "Oh my God, man!" You know, how long have you been doing this? And I'm like, "Well, <laughs> you know, I, I was a kid when I started, so I'm, right. I'm, I got more miles on me than I show. Kind of like an old car, you know." <laughs> so you did the uh, the Opry Opryland thing was in eighty eighty five. Is it somewhere around in there? Yeah, Something yeah, like that. Yeah, and then. When, at what point did you start? Like, because you were still doing that, but you you would go out and do artist gigs. Like, you yeah. played with Tammy Wynette for a while. Is that yeah, right? uh, see, that was kind of an, another strange story, man. Yeah. I, I was working. How'd that happened. Yeah. I got well. Like I said, yeah. Opera Land hired me to you know wanted me to come up, and I, I went to work out there uh, playing. I played the Bluegrass Show the first year, which or the, they called it the Folk Show at that back then. But yeah. CF Martin Theater they sponsored our show, so got a new Martin every year. You know, oh. so it was kind of cool. But, Anyway, Sounds awful. We, I know it. I was like, oh, I was a happy guy, being yeah. an old, old mountain boy, you know. And anyway, played played that sh- show the first year, and the next year <clears throat> they came around, and uh, we had so many shows at Opryland of different kinds too. We had everything from Broadway to rock and roll to you know soul to you know bluegrass, country. Every everything was kind of represented. Gospel. Anyway, they went through and picked people out of every the the cream of the crop and put it in one show for this they're trying this thing for this year and that was when we had the nashville network and so we were oh, yeah. trying to uh you know we put they were putting people on tv and and we were getting to be on the grand old opry and everything and so mm-hmm. <clears throat> it was kind of 
that that was the I went did that show that year, but there were so many egos in that show. <laughs> And they also sent me to Europe that year to to represent the United States. We came back. That was the first time I'd ever been anywhere like that, you know. And and, uh, so uh, when I got back, I I had – it was just – there were so many egos in that show and everything. I just had enough of it, and I was like, man, I'm out of here. So I I decided to go and and do my own thing for a while. And I had been doing shows anyway, uh, my, my own shows, traveling around. And I was down in Alabama. They had the world's largest country music concert huh. that the National Network was sponsoring. Okay. It was a three-day event on Lake Gunnersville. Now, a lot of people may remember it. It was called the Johnny Lee Picnic. Hmm. And it was a big deal. Yeah. And uh, so they had every you can any country act from that era you can think of was on this show. Huh. And uh, I was in charge of putting together the staff band. And so I hired Buddy Emmons and uh, all the greats from that era, you know. Yeah. Had two of Kenny Rogers' buses, and had I had the top of the line of everything. And I rolled yeah, in down there with, yeah. with everything, you know. Well, this promoter uh, skipped out with all the money. Oh. And <laughs> so, anyway, it was a it was a big mess. Man, and, uh, did everybody get I mean, oh no pay, nobody got money? paid loretta lynn and everybody was there at the time and i'll never forget uh we went in to get our try to get our money and the promoter just has a nervous breakdown falls out in the floor passes out in the middle of the floor you know and and the people that run the staging and everything we had massive staging and everything because yeah. it was for that big of a thing yeah, yeah. and so it, anyway so i I didn't know what I was going to do. I'm a kid, and I've got all these big you've time wrangled musicians. all this together, yeah. and then somebody runs off with and the I, money. And it, yeah. but but luckily, Buddy Emmons was with me at the time yeah. when he saw it go down. Yeah, he said, "Son, I've been doing this a lot of years, and I've never seen that go down." He said, "Usually, I can see it going to happen." He said, "But I right. didn't see this one." He said, "So you don't owe me a dime." He said, "I had more fun playing with you guys this <laughs> week than I have in years." And I had yeah. you know Johnny Neal, a bunch of great players. And yeah. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> So I was like, I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to do this no more. I'm going back to working for somebody else. I'm yeah. tired of working for myself. Mm-hmm. And so Ralph Emery back then was on the Nashville Network. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so Ralph came over and put his arm around me. And he said, "Son," he said, "It's been a rough day." He was doing the whole thing. He, oh, said, he was the he MCN said, or something. Yeah. Okay. And uh, he said, he said, I got to tell you, he said, I'm really impressed with what you do. He said, Why don't you come over to Channel Four on Monday? And uh, they had a morning show he did here in Nashville. Okay. Kind of like Country Boy Eddie was in Alabama's okay. morning show. And so I went over there that Monday morning, and uh, he was he was like, we'll get you something going. Mm-hmm. So I came over there, man, and and immediately I got a call from, uh, once again, Mel Tillis called and Tammy Wynette called, and uh, her people called. Yeah. And uh, wanted to know if I was interested in going to work for them, both of them that same morning, because I did the trick fiddle thing that I used to do. I oh, did that on, on the, TV that on morning. The TV th- oh, wow. So they saw it on TV that morning and called that day. And so I went to audition. And uh, when I auditioned for Tammy, she was like working for your mom. She was yeah. just the sweetest lady and just a heart of gold, you know, and just yeah. and just made me feel comfortable. And she's from, you know, over in western side of Alabama. And, so we kind of just hit it off from the get go. So I didn't even go to the Mel Tillis audition. Oh really? And I felt bad about it because I love Mel Tillis. I thank the world to him. And uh, yeah. But uh, anyway, I so I went to work for her, and I worked for her for about three years. Yeah. Uh, and she'd feature me in the show, and and uh, me and her were card partners on the bus <laughs> and everything. You know, she's just a sweetheart. But that kind of got me uh, back to working for stars. You know, and right. And uh, of course, I was just a kid when all that went down. But I mean. You get burned in this That business. whole time, were you still doing stuff with Opryland, though? Were you yes. Still, yeah, still doing those shows. Yeah, whenever I was in town, you know, I'd just let them know when I was in town. Yeah. and I'd go out there and, and do shows. And and uh, we did, back then, I was doing tons of corporate events. Yeah. Uh, of course, Opryland brought in a lot of corporate and stuff events. Yeah, yeah, big yeah, conventions. Yeah. And, and uh, I was one of the top corporate guys in the United States for about 20 years. And so... That was my thing was doing corporate. Yeah, I've events. seen. I've not been to one live, but I've seen many clips, and it is very. It's an entertaining show. <laughs> oh, it's sure. fun, man! I mean, back then we really did it up. I mean, yeah. Depending on a what size corporation you're working for, you know, I did some of them for like, uh, for you know, the big car companies, Toyota and and GMC and different yeah. ones. You know, would come in and they'd spend a fortune and. So I'd bring in Give them a fortune and, show. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, man! I'd you know whatever they got budget for, I'd find it for them. You know, and <laughs> we'd do the whole nine yards, everything from lookalikes to you know uh, dancers and and you name it. We'd yeah. have a massive show going off pyro, lasers, 
the whole nine yards. When you came up here for for the Opryland thing, having that be your okay, now I'm moving up there. Yeah. Did you have a goal in mind, like long term, or did yeah. you just be like, I want to play music? You know. What? Well, I tell you, man, I, that's uh, that's always been one of my philosophies, man. If you're going to do anything in life, you need to have a goal. Yeah. If you don't have a goal, you're kind of just a ship drifting around, mm-hmm. you know. And I, my goal was back then to to be a star, you know. I thought that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. Until I started working for stars. Right. And truthfully, peek behind the curtain a little bit. Yeah. Like, Wait a minute. Well, I tell you, man, I, I worked for so many of them through the years, and and you'd start looking at their personal life, right? And you start looking at their family, their kids. And you think, well, what's it worth? Mm-hmm. You know, and and really, that's when it hit me. I was like, uh, and when then, and especially when I got out there and I was working for Opryland, and I started after I left Opryland and went work with Tammy for a while. They called me back and were kept wanting me to come back and do a show at Opryland, and so I just threw a giant number at them. Yeah, because er- nobody out there contracted shows. Everybody worked for the company, and you got a union scale check. And I was like, I really didn't want to do it, so I priced it way up high. Yeah. And they bit. <laughs> and so. And then you're like, well, shit, I guess I'll, yeah, guess I'll do it. <laughs> exactly, man. Yeah. And that's what I did. I beat up. I contracted this thing to him, and I kind of was shocked. And so I, I thought, well, man, I, I make you know ten times what I'm making on the road, and, and stay in town. And yeah. So I started doing that in 1990, yeah. and uh, so I stayed. I stayed out there, and I'd do. Back in the old days, I'll never forget. I hired some some of my friends from Alabama. Hired mm-hmm. a bunch of people. Hired, my, and that was the thing. I was able to hire my own, do my own hiring and firing. Put yeah, together my own show. Your own deal. So, yeah. Didn't have a producer, a director, none of those people that they had in all these other shows. They let me do my own thing. Yeah, and uh, had an exclusive deal with with John Haywood, where I was able to talk to him. And I told him, I said, That's if nice, it sucks, yeah. send somebody over, and then right. we'll talk about it. But until then, just tell them people to stay out of my way. Yeah. And so they did, and let me do my thing, and I was able to hire the kind of players that they needed out there. Yeah, I'll never forget. I hired a guy from Alabama, Mark Dreyer. This he's worked for me now for twenty-seven years playing guitar, and uh, he uh, was right out of Berkeley College. He called me actually because he just graduated, and he's, yeah. he's he knew me from Gadsden. I used to work in a music store in Gadsden. Okay, and he called me, and he was like, "Man, I heard you putting together shows up there." And so. He shows up with this good-looking blonde in a convertible <laughs> Mustang that drove him around, you know. Yeah. Like any musician, he didn't have a decent found, car. Yeah, so he found, so, <laughs> found somebody that did, yeah. But they were like, after they saw him play, they were like, you'll never be able to train him to do what you want to do. And I was like, why would you want to train a guy? Yeah. I'm like, I'm going to find somebody that does what I want to do and turn him loose. Yeah. You know, and so anyway, that's my show ended up being the number one show out there for a long time. But uh, – getting back to what i was trying i don't know what you were asking me oh no, yeah yeah uh just go that, like that turned mean, into yeah. you know I, I wanted to be a star yeah but that turned into such a good paying job that i got comfortable mm-hmm. and i was more comfortable doing what i was doing and staying out there and playing shows staying in town sleeping in my own bed at night i was able to go play sessions and stuff and when i needed to i could work around my schedule yeah, I was comfortable to, in in the yeah. in the good way, in the positive. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, was, I was comfortable with every the whole situation because it was it was very low pressure. Yeah, and I was making a ton of money, and I was able to do what I wanted to do. Uh, had my own record label, had did everything myself, and it yeah. worked out really good, man. You know, and 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 having having an opportunity where you can hire people that fit. And you don't have any guys in your band that, you know, I always called them cancers. You, you, yeah. get, you get one guy in a band that's got a bad attitude. Sucks the mood yeah. out of the everything. It kills. Yeah. There's no fun in it anymore. And every time you turn your back, he's bad-mouthing you and talking some crap behind your back. And yeah. trying to, and it no gets, time for causes, causes the whole thing just to go down the tubes. Well, I was able to keep a good bunch of people, keep some of the best session players in Nashville worked for me out there for years because they, they needed to sub – they could if had a session come in. They could go do it. I had them about five deep in each yeah. position, and so it it made it just really a lot more pleasant. But but 
being able to stay out there and, and, and I gave up being a star because I didn't want to be gone. Mm-hmm. And I also started having kids about that time. And I was yeah. like, after seeing how some people had millions and millions of dollars, had all the fame and fortune, but were miserable. Yeah. Because they're out there away from home all the time. Their kids don't even know who they are when they come back to town. They've got a nanny or something raising their kids. Mm-hmm. And it's just, I, I just kind of, it just spooked me. I was like, man, that's not the guy I want to be. Yeah. Well, I, that's that's a, an know. admirable, admirable uh, thing. To be able I don't to know. Because you know? looking back, you know, you kind of think about it sometimes. <laughs> you think, man, I, I had so many great opportunities. But but I actually, I, I mean, looking back, I probably wouldn't change anything. But, yeah. But there's so when you have somebody come into this town with stars in their eyes, and they're only that's only they they get blinders on, and all yeah. the thing they see is fame and fortune, and they don't see the cost that that comes at sometimes. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it's I had the opportunity to work with all these people when I was really young, so I was able to see it. Yeah, and, see and reassess. Yeah, what exactly do I want to do? Yeah, and it's like that. anything in life, man. If your dad works in a steel mill, if he's gone all day every day, and he's pursuing a, a higher life than what you've got, sometimes people get so caught up in making a living that they forget to live. Yeah, and it's it's uh, you know, it's like anything, man. <laughs> yeah, no, I get it for sure. What would uh, what is your do you have a preference between studio or live shows recording versus live live shows live shows always that's the other bad thing here in Nashville you know and it's not as bad as it used to be because there's really not as much recording as there used to be in in town but but um, we used to call it turd polishing you know it's like you'd get people that and and ninety nine percent of them are wannabe songwriters yeah and and they they've got a you know, saved up some money and they come to town with a terrible song. Yep. And with with really no chance of getting a cut. Yeah. And but they they hire a bunch of players. Well, you go in, play, and yeah. you spend the day turd polishing. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. So you do the best you can to make it sound good, and but it just gets it. That really gets. Uh, it it'll zap it'll zap yeah. every bit of the drive Jades out it a little of bit, yeah. Oh my god, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I <laughs> so feel, I like live shows. I like I like recording, and I, I like it more. I guess the more I do it, I really do enjoy it and the creative process of it. Oh, I like recording but, my own stuff. Yeah, yeah. But I do. But I also, to me, live shows is like that's the peak to me. Yeah, you, get, you get to play live. Instant you get the energy. Feedback. Yeah, and the energy. That, yeah, between you and the crowd, when people is, love it. You know it right then. Yeah. Where in the studio, if you cut something. Everybody's still grinning, you know. Yeah. And then you go out and you play it for somebody, and they're kind of under their breath saying, "Oh, that sucked," you right. know. But oh yeah, that you ain't got a crowd good. sitting on yeah. their hands right. or standing up and applauding, you know. Right. You know, right then. But I always loved live shows. That's of course that's always been my thing, really. Yeah. But yeah. When did uh, when did the the Kid Rock friendship come, <laughs> come about? You know, we had to talk about that. Yeah, was- oh man, that's the strangest thing, you know. Because man, I was kind of happy with just being kind of halfway semi-retired here, you know, the last yeah. few years. and and Because uh, you had the General Jackson showboat thing yeah. ended a couple of years well, ago or something like that? Well, yeah, Marriott bought out the General, or bought out Gaylord, basically. Okay. And uh, <laughs> their priorities changed from entertainment to, you know. Hospitality or yeah, whatever, yeah. Yeah, hotel. And so yeah. they were, you know, it, it just the whole thing changed over there. Entertainment yeah. just kind of went to be a, kind of the wayside. So I thought, well, I've been here long enough. It's time. It's been yeah. a good good opportunity for me to slide out. So I did, and uh, and started working a little theater over there, you know, and and uh, did that for a while. But but I've got a bunch of property here in Nashville, you know. Over the years, mm-hmm. I'd when I'd hit a good lick, I'd buy a piece of property, you know. Yeah. So, so uh, I've got 105 acres right off of Briley Parkway out there, and and. Uh, and my neighbor on the one side of me was talking about selling some property, and and I was going to buy it. I went and looked at it and everything, and it was kind yeah. of just a you know a little overpriced. You know how it is. You're looking for a deal. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, <clears throat> anyway, it had been on the market for several years, and uh, finally got a, I got a call one day, and he said, "Man, I I got the property's pending." He said, "It's somebody in the music business, but it's, it's not in the country music business. But they won't tell us who it is. They got a non-disclosure on it." Hmm. And I was like, well, okay. And so <laughs> finally I knew it had sold. And yeah. uh, I'm thinking, well, I wonder who it is, you know. So uh, 
I'm back there on my tractor, you know, I'm always, I'm a hillbilly man. I'm, I'm back there on my tractor, bush hogging my trails and stuff. And, and, uh, like your granddad back there. In your oh overalls. yeah. I was, yeah. man. That's where I live. But, yeah. and so I, I was back there and I, this dude pulls up with long hair and a four wheeler, you know, pulls up beside me. I thought, well, that looked kind of like Kid Rock, you know, and I didn't really know much about Kid Rock at the yeah. time, you know, I knew his reputation had preceded him. So I right. was kind of thinking, I'm not going to like this guy. Uh-huh. You know, I really, <laughs> and so anyway, we get to talking, hanging out and he tells a story in the show. Now it's kind of funny. He's got, he tells his story. He says, I ask him what he does. And he says, Oh, I play a little fiddle and I just <laughs> left it at that. I didn't really, I didn't figure he cared what I did. Right. You know? So I just left it at that. And, so anyway, that night he says, come on up here, man, bring your fiddle. And so went over and we had a little shindig. And so I blazed a few tunes and he was like, he tells the show, he's like, <laughs> he's like holy shit, man. He's like, little fiddle my ass. Yeah. He's like, you're going to work for me, you know? So, uh, anyway, we, how long, how long ago was that? <laughs> it's been a couple, a couple, three years ago. Yeah. But, uh, we just kind of hit it off and just became real good friends, man. I mean, so he's he, a good guy. Like, oh, he's a great guy, man. Just, and, and the whole stage persona is a different guy. You yeah. Know? And, uh, we really hit it off and he reminds me of a guy I went to school with. And so we just kind of, we have a good time yeah. hanging out. So many people know? don't get that about like show business that it's show business. Yeah. So a lot of people that you, they look like something when they're on stage or their persona yeah. or whatever. That whole persona. Be, yeah. You know, everybody thinks, oh man, he stays stoned all the time. He don't even smoke weed. You know, really? yeah, you know, it's like, and it's totally against it, you know, but huh. on stage, he's all about it, you know, and everything in the songs are all got stuff about it. Yeah. But I mean, we, we do, we do party pretty hard, but, uh, you know, we tend to, you know, we don't do anything illegal yeah. anymore. Right. <laughs> anymore. Trade stories about the old days. Oh, uh, yeah. man. But he's a great guy, man. You so know, when did you start playing with him pretty soon? After yeah, that? yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was so funny. I was telling him, uh, he had a, we were going to do a New Year's gig up in uh, Louisville. Yeah. And uh, it's a big arena up there, Yum, Yum Center. And uh, he was like, man, I want you to come up there and play with us. And I was like, dude, I ain't never even seen your show. Yeah. And he was like, well, you're going to see it standing behind me tonight. Wow. I was like, all right, dude. So I came up and I we had I had one run through. And uh, basically, they didn't really even play the thing that I was going to be playing. They were working on New Year's Eve stuff, you know, yeah. stuff that they only play that night. You right. Know? So we ran over a few things. But. He had a guy that his only job was to keep me from getting blown up on stage because all the pyro and, pyro and yeah. crap going off and big flames that go plumb, you know, to the ceiling. Do you just come out for like a handful of songs? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That kind of deal. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, anyway, but he let me feature, you know, and so he'll just like, we'll break down cowboy or something yeah. in the middle of it and he'll just let me blaze. Yeah. And so I'll go out there and just wear it out, you know, and of course the crowd's just going nuts because yeah. it's something different. And, uh, right. And then we'll just break it back down. Of course, the drummer will break it back down. We're right back into Cowboy or whatever, whichever song it is. And, yeah. And, uh, do, of course, I don't do all the shows with him anymore. I just do yeah. some, but, but we have a ball. But it's, that's it's, great. It's really unique. I was like, it, I, it's, it's like my whole career has been that way, man. It's like, uh, one of the first records I played on was Bill Monroe. Really? Here in Nashville. And, uh, first when I was just a kid and it's, you, you kind of, you have that moment where you look, you look around and you go, wait, how'd I get here? Yeah. You know, and it's like one night I was, did that when I was behind Tammy Wynette. I was thinking, cause we used to, you know, make fun of that hillbilly kind of stuff, you know, when I was a kid, cause I played in rock and roll bands when I was in high school, played huh. ba- bass and heavy metal bands and stuff. Oh, wow. And so here I was standing behind Tammy Wynette one day and I was like, how did I get here, man? Right. You know, and, and same way with all like the other kind stars, of you know. Into, into things yeah. The cause way. through the years, you know, people like Keith Whitley and, and George Jones and, and Merle Haggard and uh, so did you play you played with those yeah, people through the years and Randy yeah. Travis uh just a ton of folks wow. through the years but you you kind of look at it and you go wow man that that happened you know yeah. and, but this kid rock thing's just been been silly i mean it's yeah. been <laughs> off the chain i was like cuz i mean what's the odds of of a film yeah player? you thought you were just going to be tractor in and yeah and you know out. And, and so, you know, every time, like, he was in town uh, for the eclipse the other day. And oh, yeah. He calls me. He said, man, I just landed at the airport. What are you doing? Get over here, man. So I'm only in town for tonight. Was so. y'all's place in the, the totality line or whatever? Could you see the, oh, full, yeah. the full eclipse? Yeah, and everything? yeah it was great. Nice. But, uh, I mean, I've, I've got a bulldozer out there, so I've got roads cut in. So we've got a 
we've got our own little road system back there between <laughs> our farms, so nice. we close the gates and we and just go back and forth. Yeah, there, yeah, so we've got between us, we've got uh, about three hundred acres out there now. So right in Metro oh, Nashville. Yeah, <laughs> wow. So is it like so just off Briley? Yeah, so that's pretty yeah, close. Yeah, right there, uh, close to in White's Creek. There, close okay. to Fontenelle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In that so area kind of flooded close to oh, there not yeah. long ago like, oh man my was, gates were underwater wow yeah, it got but of course I, w- I was out here in hendersonville but yeah. it got it it got pretty bad down there oh man who would you think who is you did you have a favorite person that you've played with played music with through the years yeah man I, i'd say uh probably willie nelson yeah oh, one I of my favorites great. yeah uh, yeah because what you see is what you get there's no yeah. you know so many so many nashville types there's there's especially the younger stars and the ones that kind of hit it without working for it mm-hmm. and they they kind of they you can see them turn the switch on and they're a different yeah. person you know and it's just a different thing but with willie what you see is what you get yeah. like it you don't he don't care <laughs> you know yeah. either way and so i always heard with like his live shows that it's pretty much you just watch listen and hold on oh that's like it with willie like you just kind of follow him wherever willie goes there's no set list there's no yeah. uh you don't know how long he's gonna play i i remember uh having to leave the stage maybe three times to go pee before <laughs> and he don't care because he just he was just he going, don't care yeah. you just ease off go do your thing come back hmm. and uh <laughs> i was pretty young when i was played for him and and uh it was kind of my, my granddaddy was still alive back yeah. then and down in alabama and, and he had one of those big C band satellite dishes, you know, where you the old old timey big yeah, dish, the you huge know. Ones, yeah. And you could always tell when he was watching the Nashville network, it would point a different way. Huh. You, know, you could tell which way it was pointed, you know. Yeah. And uh <clears throat> anyway, I he bought one because I was on back then I was on the Nashville network all the time when I was at Opryland, I started doing my own shows and I was out there all the time on the Nashville yeah. network. And I did hee haul and some stuff like that huh. back in the That's day. That's awesome. And uh so that's you know, in the, in the mid eighties. And, uh, so anyway, uh, I'll never forget. Willie had started a, a new network on satellite called the outlaw network. Hmm. And, uh, so we'd shot a, this was when Willie was going through all the tax problems. Oh yeah. yeah. And, uh, I'll never forget, man. He, some, they'd even taken his guitar and the so trigger. Did, yeah. They took wow. trigger and, uh, auctioned it off and he didn't have a guitar, man. He played, uh, my guitar player Mark Dreyer, he played his guitar Telecaster, wow. and uh, wow, did any, they did somebody sell it back to him or something? Yeah, oh. yeah, he ended up able to buy it back. Wow, but it was some friends of his bought almost everything he had. Oh, okay, you know, so he was able to that get it, nice. but at the time yeah. it was all frozen. And so, gotcha. anyway, I, I'll I'll just ne- I'll never forget Willie though, man. He just uh, he was just the coolest cat ever, you know, but. And I sang harmony with him, so it was oh, really cool. That's awesome. You'd have to watch his lips because he would right. never sing it the same way twice. Right. And so you just have to really watch him and be ready for whatever he threw yeah. your way. And, I talked uh, with uh, with Waylon Payne, Jody, yeah. Jody's son. Yeah. Um, he was on an earlier episode of the podcast here. And I was oh asking yeah, him, man! Like it was cool. I talked to Waylon about his own, you know, his stuff and his life, just like we've, uh, yeah. we've done. But I said I got to got to nerd out a little bit here because i'm like <laughs> willie nelson is my number one top of the mountain like my yeah. favorite ever yeah. and he said that that's a good person to have and yeah. I, he said I, I asked him like what's willie like just sitting here talking like this he said willie nelson is the same willie nelson yeah. you see in every movie in any tv show <laughs> in any interview he said that's just willie that's will that's just willie yeah and man i i, I thought it was funny they were interviewing at the, at the time uh about all the tax problems and stuff and yeah his philosophy was he, he told i'll never forget this he told a reporter this one night he said he said well way i look at it he said money you can't eat it you can't smoke it so what good is it <laughs> and i was like oh my god that's great you know but that's just a little much you know from my way of thinking yeah. but, but uh but he was just the coolest guy ever and of course Waylon. You know, was Waylon Jennings was just yeah. the best too, man. So did you put, did you get to play with him? Any? Just a few times, but yeah. I went to uh, went to Europe together with him one time, and uh, oh, wow. him and Jesse and Buck Owens. Oh and, man, uh, Tammy Wynette. I was with Tammy at that time, but yeah. I played with everybody because that's nice. the cool thing. Back then, you know, we, we were doing package shows, and they'd be like, "Hey, man, won't you sit in with us? Play with us too?" So I'd play with everybody, mm. you know. And man, and it was the biggest time we used to have a ball, but. Uh, 
<laughs> I don't know what all stories I should tell or not. I can tell anything, <laughs> anything you want to share. It's all up to One you. of my favorite Wayland stories, though, man, is uh, Ralph Mooney was a steel player. That, yeah. That, with all those signature steel licks on Wayland's records was mm-hmm. Ralph Mooney. And uh, Ralph was uh, – had had a heart attack and he'd been off the road for a while and hadn't been out with Waylon. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I'll never forget Ralph's wife. He, you know, Moody wanted to go on this trip over to, to Europe. He wanted to go. Yeah. Well, he made his wife made Waylon promise he'd take care of him, wouldn't let him be drinking, wouldn't let him be getting in no <laughs> trouble. Waylon promise? Yeah. <laughs> and so. At the time, so I was with Tammy Wynette. Well, Charlie Carter, which is the, the – he was this senior guy with us at that time. Yeah. He came to Nashville with George Jones when he was in George's original band in Texas. Oh, and wow. And he came okay. here with George Jones. Well, when George and Tammy got married, when they split, he stayed with Tammy. Okay. And so he had, he, he was with her her whole career. And wow, yeah. Old boy from right out of Dallas, Texas. Well – they knew each other from Texas. Him and Ralph Mooney knew okay. each other from Texas. So when we got to the Nashville airport, they started drinking beer. Right there. <laughs> right there yeah. at the airport. We get on the international flight. We fly to London. We get off in London. And back then, I used to, I was just a kid, man. So I carried around a. What were you at this time? Like 20s? Early oh, 20s? yeah, I was 20. 20 <laughs> That's crazy. That's and so I, had crazy. A, I had a big VHS camera I used to carry around, you know. Yeah. And so you I. You still have the tapes and yes. stuff? Yes. Oh, I've man. got some incredible That's stuff. That's gold. Man. But I, I, I'll never forget, I had a, had a watch, and I held a watch up in front of the camera because I shot, shot him before we left Nashville yeah. at the bar. And then I held up my watch, Short still set on Nashville time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and there it's like, you know, probably 7 in the morning our time. We've been flying all night. And yeah. They're still sitting at the bar when we got to London. <laughs> and so, wow. Anyway, this <clears throat> went on for, you know, we're, we're, doing, we're over there for like three weeks, I think, doing all these tours. Yeah. And uh, I was probably a week or so into it. And we come back to the hotel in London and uh, to spend the night. And and uh, we're all down, us and asleep at the wheel. And a whole bunch of us were hanging out together, you know, down in the, yeah. in the lobby, having some drinks after we got back to the hotel. And Waylon and Jesse walk in. And they come walking through. Well, Mooney's got his back to the door. And he was a little short cowboy guy. Probably looked like he's probably five foot tall, man. Yeah. You know, and just... And always wore his pointy cowboy boots and his little hat and a cowboy hat. And just the greatest guy you'll ever meet, though. Yeah. Incredible talent. But he's telling a big story. Waylon sees him over there drinking, you know, and he walks over and says, Mooney, you need to go to bed. You ain't, don't, you ain't supposed to be down here after that heart attack and all this stuff. You don't tell me what to do. You ain't oh, my shit. daddy. You old. And goes cussing yeah. at Waylon. Waylon <laughs> never says a word, man. Waylon just walks over and reaches down and grabs him behind the knees, throws him over his shoulder, <laughs> and walks to the elevator with Mooney over his shoulder. Wow. Takes him up, puts him to bed, and Waylon comes back down, hangs out with us for a while. Yeah. And you can see, I seen Mooney peeking around over there, waiting, <laughs> waiting for Waylon to leave. <laughs> He <laughs> come back down? Yeah, after Waylon left, man, he came back down. I can't believe that old son bitch doing that. You know, wow. it's just the funniest thing seeing his little cowboy boots over Waylon's shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> but man. we had so much fun, man. I a lot of stories that I can't tell, but we, <laughs> it's been a, it, that was that was always a fun time, though. I yeah. love Waylon; he's a great guy. That's a that's that's so great. That's crazy <laughs> that you went through. You were doing all that at like twenty twenty one. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's surreal, man, and that's. Just one. I mean, it was like there's so many of them, you know, so many greats. Yeah, and they're all. Most of them are gone now, you know, and and also going out there and growing up around the Opry too. You know, I I found that picture right over there uh, of the first time I was on the Opry. And, oh yeah, uh, down at my mom's when I was cleaning it out, and and it's hard to because you forget so many things that you that you did and and. Well, it's like you like you started there when what you were like seventeen, eighteen. Yeah, yeah. So, really. Like you technically you're an adult at eighteen, but you really right. don't like you're still growing into yourself from eighteen to oh, twenty five. Yeah. You know so much. Uh, yeah, like just doing all that while you're <laughs> playing at the Opry and the Opryland. And, yeah, and, and and you're around all these legendary players that you've watched ever since you were a kid. Yeah, you know, and and it's it's really it was it's kind of surreal, man, at times. And but with with the uh with the opry thing man it was so odd about that was that was that was one of my early goals when i was a kid you know yeah. to play the grand old opry and uh like i like i said earlier my dad died when i was 12 but i'll never forget man he uh he went to trade day in collinsville and bought me an old fiddle because yeah. they were always afraid i was going to break my granddaddy's old fiddle oh so you that's know, the, I'd you played that one for a long time okay. yeah and so uh, 
he went and bought me this old fiddle, and it was kind of, yeah. his, you know, it wasn't even playable. It was a when trade day fiddle. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And so uh, uh, I'll never forget, though, when he gave it to me, he leaned down and handed it to me, and he said, boy, he said, one of these days I'm going to come see you on the Grand Ole Opry. Yeah. Of course, he's just kidding around. Well, he died not long after that. And uh, he died on June the 28th, 1976. Yeah. June the 28th of 1986. No I, was, way. I was standing in the Opry Circle my first Man. time. Tell me that ain't weird. And I'd have cried like a baby. Well, dude, they they came and asked me. You know, they was like, "How would you like to be on the Grand Ole Opry?" We're picking. They were picking people out of Opry Land that were excelling in the park. Right. And I'm just a kid, man. I really hadn't done nothing but go out there and do my show and act a fool every day and having <laughs> yeah. fun. You know, I was just having a good time. And, right. Because we got all these tourists coming through, you know, and it was just a blast. Just, yeah. I had so much fun being that young. And, yeah, absolutely. And, you know. And, and to go out there and have fun playing yeah. music. Yeah. And so yeah. they asked me to be on. And then when they told me the date, I was like, no way. You know, I was man. like, it can't be right. So, and I, I got out there. I'll never forget. They said, you've got three minutes. You get on, you get off. Yeah. And they got this giant clock at your feet that counts down to the hundredth of a second. Wow. You know, it's got the let, the numbers just running at the end. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm thinking that when I get on stage that day, I'm thinking three minutes, get on, get off. So I do my three minutes and I'm. Do you remember what song you played? Yeah. I, I did uh, uh, the, uh, I did, uh, I did Tennessee Waltz. Oh, yeah. I did oh, that. Yeah. And then I turned around to walk off. And Roy Acuff grabbed me by the shoulder because I'm thinking three minutes, get on, get off. I better yeah. get off this stage. I want to get asked back, you know. So right. Yeah, yeah. I'm headed off, and he grabs me and says, "Come here, boy." And I've got a standing ovation. Wow. He said, "I think they want to hear another one out of you." And man, uh, and I'm I'm I, I'm thinking, man, we ain't got nothing else, you yeah. know. Was, We're not prepared. Yeah. yeah. And luckily, I knew all the guys in the staff band, and okay. so they were able to jump in and with me. And so we did uh, did another song. But yeah. the coolest thing was. I'll never forget this, man. I, I looked over in the wings, and they'd heard all the commotion back in the back, mm -hmm. heard the standing ovation. Yeah. So all these old stars were coming out to see what's going on. Wow. And I look over in the wings, and there's Bill Monroe. And, there's, and of course, Roy Acuff standing right here beside me. Yeah. There's Minnie Pearl. And, man. Uh, all, you know, little Jimmy Dickens. All these stars I grew up watching, and they're all standing there watching me, and I'm standing in that circle. And I was like, wow. And so, and but I did. I gave it everything I had. Yeah, and, uh, and so that's the thing. As I was thinking, my dad's finally gonna see me play. Yeah, you know, it's what I was thinking, and so I gave it everything I had, and I got that standing ovation. But I, I played. I take that back. I played Orange Blossom. Okay, and then I did Tennessee Waltz for an I encore. Gotcha. And uh, but it was it was surreal when I came off that stage. This is another thing. I come to find out that she had done this to a lot of people after I told this story a few times, but. Mm -hmm. I came off the stage, and Minnie Pearl grabbed me after I came off the stage. She said, young man, you realize what just happened to you? And I was like, I didn't never met her before. Yeah. And so I was like, uh, yeah, this is great. And she said, you see those people stand up for you? And I said, yes, ma'am, it was great. And she said, do you know why they stood up for you? And I'm like thinking, I didn't know what to say to her, you know. And right. I said, well, I guess they liked it. And she said, they loved it. She said, you know why they love it? She said, because, she said, because you love them. And he said, "If you," she said, "If you ever try to fake it, they'll see through it." Yeah. And I was like, "Wow, that's great. man, that's some wisdom." Yeah. Right. It turns out Garth Brooks told me she told him the same story. Yeah, that's a good thing to tell. Yeah, yeah, that's great. But yeah. she was a sweetheart, man. And I, I played a ton of corporate events later with her. And, with her, yeah. Yeah, play her on with coming around the mountain and all oh, that. Yeah. You know, back in the old days, but huh. but the Opry was always there's it was it was uh, it was always a lot of fun go over and do that because we would do I, I get. My stories get rambling. No, sometimes, please, but, please. This is great. But, uh, this is golden. I had. A, I was telling you earlier about hiring those guys to play with me at Opryland. Yeah. When I first put that band together, I asked them all. I was like, "All right, you guys want to work? Yeah, we want to work, man. We want. Well, we want to work." Yeah. And I'm thinking that your your philosophy of work and mine might be two different things. Right. So I started booking an opening session in the morning for a corporate event. We'd do that first thing in the morning, usually at 7, 30, 8 o'clock in the morning. Oh, wow. And I'd go out, tell them, we'd go out and play a real blazing song. I'd tell a few jokes, welcome everybody to Nashville, hope you have a good time while you're here, play another song, and we were done. Yeah. And then we'd go to Opryland, and we'd go over there, and I'd play sometimes five or six shows a day at wow. Opryland, out in the heat. Yeah. Then we'd go <clears throat> play the General Jackson at night. That night. 
So Man. we'd work all day, and then we'd do it again the next day. We'd do that six days a week sometimes, and sometimes seven days, depending on the season. And uh, and but. But by the time August, raking in the money, yeah, August <laughs> September rolled around, man. Everybody's like, "Chief, we need a break." Yeah, and I'm like, "Wait a minute, man! You just bought a new house. You just bought a new car. Yeah, you right. just got got a new kid. Y'all sure you want to take a break? You know, so let's yeah. make it while you know, you, it, make it all we can. Yeah, yeah man. <clears throat> so we hit it hard for years out there. You yeah, know, but uh, you know that those days are kind of over though. There's nothing. Back then, we had so many tourists here, and it wasn't all just playing clubs yeah these people were there to hear music that's yeah that's the it's so different now in that there's still a ton of tourists here right but it's become in just the time that i've been here in eight years it's it's become where people come here to go out and see how drunk they can get right and there happens to be a band playing that and that's but it. it's not they're not coming here to hear the music and to see the musicians play right you know? And, and it's a, it's that's a the total difference, difference of where yeah. Opera was. Opera was the best music college you could ever went to. Yeah. I'm telling you, man, you could go out there every day. I'd go out and I'd try something new. I'd throw it out in front of a live audience and I'd see if it worked. And yeah. if it didn't work, I scratched it and put something in its place. Right. So I had by the, you know, I had a show that I'd put up against anybody. Yeah, after that much. Yeah, because yeah. I had it down to a science. <clears throat> and it was something everybody from a, from the little kids to grandma would like. Yeah. You know, and it and you had to. It, it was a very unique crowd, right, out there because it was kind of a ran the gamut of ages and and yeah. And the coolest thing to me would was always I always find, and this is a bad habit for for entertainers. I'd find the person that looked like their wife dragged them in there, yeah, and looked like he was having the most crappy day of his life, uh-huh. and it's hot out there in the in opera and it gets so hot, miserable. And you could see when he walked in, he's sitting there, and you could just tell he would rather be anywhere than sitting it's in my there, show. Yeah. And if I couldn't get him by the end of the show, I didn't feel like I'd done my job. Yeah, you're trying and to make that guy have a Everybody good time. else, I had no problem because I did a lot of comedy in my show, too. So uh-huh. I had no, no problem getting everybody else to laugh in that place. Mm-hmm. You'd see a little grin come on him. And then by the end of the show, you've got him. Yeah, you know, and if you don't, you know that and that's a bad habit because it's it puts a lot of pressure on you. But I, I, it was it was something you did so many shows. Yeah, that anything that was something different to be a challenge something was to be working on. Yeah, right. something to do. That was one of the cool things. Back to that that email that you sent me back, um, back when I first moved here was one of the things that you said that stuck with me was the difference, like being able to when you want to do it for work to work like work, work, like when you're at work work oh yeah and not just be there because like you said when you came up you could really see the difference in the people who were just goofing off and oh, partying yeah. and going out there and coasting through and the people that looked at it as okay i'm in this business this is my work yeah i'm gonna work at it yeah uh, difference in playing music in the music business right yeah that's it and that's the truth there's a lot of them want to come up here they want to be weekend warriors they want mm-hmm. to come up here and they want to, you know, say I, I, I played at Tootsie's. Well, great, yeah. you know. But if you want to have <clears> – <throat> this is another one that I'll tell you a good yeah. story. Conway Twitty told me one time. I was opening shows for Conway when I was still in high school. <laughs> and yeah. uh, I'd travel around southeast down there. And uh, we were over in Georgia you got to write night. a book one of these days. Oh, Tim, I don't I can't forget, the problem is I can't remember it until like, something <laughs> pops in my head. Yeah, But – uh I was I would follow him around and I'd ask him questions and I was just a kid man yeah. I was probably at that time I was probably sixteen seventeen right and uh, I'd be asking him questions and, and one night he said son come in here and sit down and eat with me and just ask me everything you want to ask me and get it off your chest <laughs> just get it over <laughs> I yeah. know it so anyway I I, I was just asking uh, you know. What, what? How do you stay in the business? How do you get started? How do you? Yeah. I, all these questions, you know, that I had, like like a lot of kids do. Yeah, sure. And uh, I'll never forget. He told me. He said. He said. Well, he said, if you're gonna be a recording artist, he said, I I hadn't always had number one records. He said, but I'm always in the charts somewhere. Yeah. He said, and you've got to work it. You got to stay out there and work it. He said, you don't want to be a one hit wonder. Yeah. Where everybody else does the work for you, and when they decide they're tired of you, they can can you. Yeah. And so, and if you notice, if you, look at, if you yeah. look at record business, that's the way it is. They'll find them somebody, they'll have a number one record, and then they'll be gone. They'll Never hear from them the again. Shelf and, yeah. And you run into them at a grocery store somewhere years later, and they're broke. Yeah. And of course, they got to 
a, you know, a platinum record on their wall. Yeah, but they're playing at the local bar down yeah, the street. Yeah, and it's and he he just gave me some wise advice on that. You know, just to make it, it's a business, and yeah. to work it like it's a business. Just like if you're hanging shingles, man. You know, yeah. If you go out there and you you put your, pass your cards out and you everybody you meet, hey man, I'm in the roofing business. I'm yeah. on I want to roof 